Hey guys, so this is a summary of integration and the best way I could really think to describe this video is how the heck do you know what to do with all this integration stuff? So one of you wonderful subscribers submitted this idea, so thank you very much. And hopefully this kind of clears up and ties everything together. So in this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare these three pretty basic integrals and we're really going to get into depth of what we know about each one of them. So we're going to talk about what techniques can you use and then what techniques should you use? So those are two very different things. So before I go any farther, I just want to warn you that I do assume you've already learned about the fundamental theorem of calculus and everything up to that. Otherwise, this video is not going to make a lot of sense and it's going to seem like it goes very fast. If you have not learned those things, then you should learn that material first. Like I said, otherwise this video is really going to go too fast. I'm, I'm really assuming you've kind of seen it, but now you need it all tied together. So that's exactly what I want to do. So let's go ahead and tie it all together. So starting with this in this first one. So the indefinite integral of two X DX. So this is an indefinite integral. So let's think about that. Well, an indefinite integral, so the, the actual definition of it is it's the collection of all antiderivatives of f. So it's denoted like this, so that's exactly what we have, and so it's pronounced the indefinite integral of f with respect to x. So just a really quick overview, like I said, I'm, I'm really reviewing everything here. So you've got your little integral signed, this part here is called the integrand, and then you've got your x here in this dx, that's your variable of integration. So really, from that definition, all we want from this is, is the antiderivative. And there's really no like geometric significance to this. It's really just about the antiderivatives. And so the antiderivatives, they're just a bunch of formulas. Now I'm gonna really quickly show you the list of all of the antiderivative formulas that you should know. So you can pause the video if you don't know these. So I've got the function and then what its antiderivative is. So you can see each one of these. And so this is something that you're going to have to know in Calc 1, in Calc 2. If you don't know these going into a test, you need to make note cards and definitely know all of these, like the back of your hand, just like you need to know derivatives. So there's quite a few formulas, it's quite a bit. They are very similar to derivative formulas, but they do have a little bit of a twist. So you definitely need to memorize these. The other thing that I wanna point out before I move on that dx, you have to have this. So I know a lot of times when students learn this material, it feels like the dx is just fluff, but it really does have significance and you're totally gonna get dinged by any calculus teacher if you, if you just start dropping that. So just a, a heads up on that. Okay, so now let's pivot to this next integral. So this is a definite integral. And so definite integrals, so I just wanna remind you like kind of what are the definitions that, that go with this. So the formal definition of a definite integral is, is pretty heavy stuff. So you have f of x is a function defined on this closed interval and j is the definite integral of f over this closed interval and j is the limit of this Riemann sum if the following is true. So this is a two page, two page definition. So this is the epsilon delta definition of this, and it talks about partitions and it talks about all this stuff. But I wanna point out actually just the really important thing uh, about this. I, I have other videos where I really break down this definition. And like I said, this is just kind of a summary video. So the, the, the thing about this is that this is kind of referring to a Riemann sum. So you should definitely have already seen Riemann sums for this video and then just kind of know like, the actual definition of a definite integral is referring back to a Riemann sum. And then just to go through a couple other things, so things with definite integrals. So this here, this little like almost S-shaped curve, this is an integral sign. The A and B are called the limits of integration. This part here is the integrand, and then the dx is referring to our variable of integration as is, as is that x. Okay, so the other thing I wanna point out is as part of the definition of the definite integral, so this is a definite integral and it technically equals this limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum using right endpoints. So there's this connection between the two. And there's, there's actually one other thing I wanna point out. So if f of x is non-negative and integrable over uh, this closed interval, then the area under the curve is also found by using 
the definite integral. So, so what does all of this mean? So how do we tie this all together? So what this means is that this can be computed using either Riemann sums or area formulas. Now, Riemann sums are pretty heavy stuff, and so I have plenty of videos where I compute Riemann sums as n goes to infinity. So this whole, so going back to this definition, this whole little exercise here, this, this takes a little bit of time, so I'm not going to do it in this video. But I have videos where I do this, so if you want to see more examples of this, um, you, can, you can check those out. But if you've been doing these, then you, you know exactly what I'm referring to. So you can compute this using a Riemann sum. Or you can just use a straight up area formula, which if we use an area formula, so literally I'm just going to take this. So I'm going to have, so I go from zero to one, two, three. So here's this, this graph of two X from zero to three. And then all I have to do from that is just draw a line going down to the Y axis and I get this area formula. Now, or then I can just use any area formula that I have for this, which in this case, this tr just turns out to be a triangle. So, you know, bada bing, bada boom, you can just calculate the area of this. Now, the thing about this is that not all functions like this, they're not all these like nice, easy area formulas. In fact, I could, I could very easily just give you like a X squared or X cubed or a sine function or something. There's lots of functions that do not have a nice, clean area formula. And so when you're learning calculus, the first thing that we kind of tell you is you can either use an area formula, and if that doesn't work, then you have to use a Riemann sum. But as you know, like the Riemann sums are really kind of gnarly to calculate. They're just, they're a lot of work. So after you kind of get these two ideas, this is where the fundamental theorem of calculus comes in. And this comes in two parts. So I'm gonna show you both parts. Again, pause the video if you need to like write these down or, or read them more. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is if f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, and, and, and then f of x is defined like this and is continuous on that closed interval, then its derivative is found like this. So this talks about this derivative. And what this, this part of the fundamental theorem of calculus did was it made a connection between definite integrals and derivatives. So basically, when you were learning calculus, so if I just go back to what we were first talking about and, and what our, our methods were. So when you're first learning calculus and you learn about definite integrals, it's like we tell you that these are the only two things that you have. But in the back of your mind, you know that like if I have an indefinite integral that that's connected to antiderivatives. And yet th these two methods have nothing to do with antiderivatives. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, the first part establishes this connection between into like antiderivatives and our definite integrals. So that's that's why we like the first part. It it allows us to use those antiderivative formulas with this. And then we have the second part. So part two. So if f is continuous over the closed interval from a b, and f is any antiderivative on this closed interval, then our definite integral is computed like this. And this literally just says now makes makes our life so much easier. Find that antiderivative and then plug in your limits of integration. So you need the first part so that we can use antiderivatives. So that's the whole part of this first part. And then this tells you how to compute those. So going back to our little example here. So with the fundamental theorem of calculus, I'm really using part two to allow me to do this, right? So I find the antiderivative of this, which I know would just be x squared. And then I just have to evaluate using the limits of integration. So then I can just plug these in. So three squared is nine, so nine minus zero, this just equals nine. And now I know that this would actually be the area of that triangle. So all three of these things are the same. This is probably the easiest to calculate. This is probably the second easiest to calculate and these should all be equal to one another. So they're, they're all getting to the same thing. Now, the question is, how do you know which one of these to use? Well, honestly, you're going to likely be told which one to use because otherwise you're going to want to just default to the easiest. And let's be honest, the easiest one is to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Once you learn this, you, you really don't want to go back to these. But when you're in a Calc 1 class, usually you're going to be forced to use these because it's a big deal to us math teachers that you understand that all of these three things are one in the same. 
So you have to demonstrate that on a test. Now, what about that fundamental theorem of calculus part one? So how would you know to use that? Well, before I tell you that, I, I would just like to take a moment to say, if you are finding this helpful, please consider giving this video a like. Anytime you give my videos likes, that's very helpful for me for growing my channel. Or consider subscribing, also super, super helpful. Or you could leave me a comment or share this video with your friends. I'm trying to share this, this channel and I'm trying to make this something really great. Um, I have big plans to expand it and you can help me whenever you like, subscribe, leave comments or share my channel. So please consider that. Okay, so back to this. So how would you know to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one? Well, here is this problem in the context of the fundamental theorem of calculus the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So if you actually take a second to look at this, these two things are quite different, right? So first of all, notice with my limits of integration. So this just has standard numbers. This has this X here. And then also for the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So notice I have this DDX. So I'm actually being told to take a derivative and then I have totally different like letters. So just everything's kind of different. So it should be very obvious, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And by the way, if I were to finish this, so this would just equal 2x. That would be the answer from the fundamental theorem of calculus. So so just to round this out then, so how would I know to use that? You, it, it should be obvious if you study the, the form. So you need to practice this. Just FYI, this tends to not come up very often. So it's very easy to forget. So you have to very intentionally study this to remember it. It's not like you're going to keep practicing it over and over again, like you will with the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So just a FYI. And so now to finish this out, so now let's talk about this, this last definite integral. So I just want you to notice what I did here with the limits of integration. So I've got this. And so, like I said, so this is a definite integral. So with these limits of integration, this is basically the same integral from before, except I just switched the limits of integration. So really what we want to do here is we want to leverage our integral properties. So that, that's what this type of problem is screaming to do. And I just want to really quickly show you those. So again, you can pause the video and, and read these if you want. So this is really talking about the order of integration. So if I want to flip my limits of integration, I just put a minus sign in front. But I have a couple more integral properties I'll show you. So this, this is not all of them. So let's see if we've got these constant multiples, sum and difference. I have a whole video where I go through all of these. So if you don't know these and you, you want to see how they work, you can check out that video. So going back to our problem. So if I want to leverage those properties then, so I'll literally just flip these limits of integration, put the negative sign in front, and then I, I know what this is going to equal. So this will just be negative nine. And that's, that's really it. So um, I will drop links to Riemann sums and, and some of the other things that I referenced in this video, but hopefully this kind of helps to tie all of the ideas together. So thanks a lot for watching guys. I appreciate it so much. You can always leave me a comment if you have an idea for a video. I'm always open to making them. I'll catch you next time.